Hello, hello, hello. This is Noreen Sumter from Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way. It is Tuesday evening, and you know what Tuesday evening is. It is the, my favorite, favorite, favorite time of the year. Why? Because I get to play with you. So I'm really excited to be here tonight. I have a wonderful, wonderful guest for you. Um, Jeffrey Kaplan from Kaplan and Associates, who is a divorce attorney. So we're going to be talking about D I V O R C. <laughs> That's Tammy Wynette. That is so old, that song, right? And uh, so we're going to be talking about divorce. We're going to be talking about the ins and outs of it. We're going to be talking about possibly prenups. You're going to get to know Jeff and you're going to get to know the ins and outs of divorce. I'm boiling already because I'm really hot. Like I sent Jeff an email today and I said, I, I'm so excited to have you on the show. I feel like a little puppy. I know it sounded retarded, but that's how I felt. We're so happy to have you here. So what have I been up to? Oh, God. I've been up to a lot, but I don't think it's made for radio. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so anyway, tonight I had a BRG meeting, which is my business referral group with my people. Shout out to the people that came to the BRG meeting. Thank you so much. For coming, we are looking to make referrals, do good business, and have a lot of fun because that's what it's really about. It's about being a service provider, loving what you do, and being being great at what you do. And I think when you are great at what you do, it's because you love it. Wouldn't you agree? Couldn't agree more. Right. So I'm sweating. Look at me. I'm sweating. I need a napkin. Um, but I'll get that in a bit. Guys, so tonight we're going to talk to Jeff Kaplan. So Jeff, can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, uh, Noreen. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I am the uh, founder and the managing member of Jay Kaplan and Associates. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a Midtown Manhattan uh, divorce and litigation law firm. We're at 60 East 42nd Street, uh, Suite 4600. Uh, I've been practicing in the area of divorce law for approximately 23 years. Uh, He's so young. Look at him. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, I've developed a, uh, a real, real interest over the years in, in helping people through uh, probably what has to be some of the uh, most difficult uh, times of their, uh, their lives. And I've really found uh, it to be fascinating, interesting, and really rewarding uh, in my practice and in my endeavors to, uh, to help people uh, through that, that time. Cool. Well, divorce is, I'd say wider than it was in the past, right? Like in the past, if you were a divorced woman, it was like you had a big D on your forehead and everybody talked about you as you walked down the street. That's how like my vision of it when I was growing up and you watch TV uh, or you say, somebody's divorced, she's divorced. It wasn't said loud. It was whispered. And uh, so, you know, it was frowned upon, right? I don't, was it frowned upon for men? Um, there are certain circles, I would have to say, where uh, I have sort of per perceived that there's a, there's a sort of a stigma attached with it. But I have to say it's probably less and less, um, at least over the course of my career, that I've noticed that that's something that uh, people are really... Um, looking at others and, and feeling that there's, you know, some sort of a, a, you know, a mark on them or, you know, because they're divorced, you know, right. there, there's a real fascination, I think, in this, uh, certainly in this state, probably in this country, if not the world, with divorce, people are just fascinated by divorces for, really? for some reason, they, uh, whether it's a celebrity divorce, you can't go on to, you know, TMZ, or any of the big, you know, uh, websites without hearing about, you know, the latest divorce, whether it's a celebrity or a, or a politician or who's done this or who's done that or who slept with who or who, who's <laughs> somehow been, been newsworthy. And I think as a culture, we have sort of uh, become so fascinated with that. And although we don't always, we don't always want all of the, uh, the sordid details, I think there's a real, um, there's a real sort of attraction that people have where they they're just they can't look away, so to speak. Hmm. Well, I, I've been I've, I'm divorced. I'm divorced now. I think more than eighteen years. I just can't remember because it was 
it's just over. So I never really think about it and I never really talk about it. And a lot of people that know me, they didn't even know I was married. That's how much I don't talk about it. Cause it is for me, it's absolutely complete. Right. And, uh, but I remember when I said I wanted a divorce, it was literally like my heart was breaking, right? Like I had created this cardinal sin in my family. Like I was the first in my family to get a divorce and it was like a sin. Oh my God, I'm going to break my family. Everybody's going to be divorced now because I created this monster. But, um, so I, yeah, I got the divorce and I remember I called it the blue paper, right? When the papers come through the mail, I call, I call it the blue paper. The blue back. So, yeah. Right. So when I, when I meet a guy and he says, I'm going for a divorce, I usually say, hit me up when you got the blue paper. <laughs> <laughs> right but when i got my blue uh divorce decree i cried you know because yes i wanted it but i didn't go into my marriage you know planning to be divorced right, right. you know and i don't think people go into marriages planning to be divorced do you think no, no absolutely not um i would say that the majority of uh, the clients that i've represented uh the initial reaction certainly is Oh no, I'm I'm good. I'm going through a divorce, whether it was a divorce that I wanted to initiate or that was sort of initiated upon me. Right. And uh, yeah, there's a real uh, there's a real feeling of, you know, this represents really failure. You know, our relationship failed, and it's not a good thing. Right. And when I first sit down with people and we're, we're talking about, you know, why it's happened, what brought them here, you know, we're, sort of the you know where have you been, where are you, and where are you going discussion that I have early on with all mm -hmm. my clients. Um, we try to, you know, understand, well, what's the alternative? You right. know, how, how about staying together in a really, really poor marriage or a really bad situation and, and how toxic that can be. Right. So, you know, in a lot of ways, divorce is really not a failure. It's a real liberating and a necessary uh, experience, which is certainly, you know, one door closes and another door opens somewhere else. You have to look at it as a very sort of, you know, it's happened and let's deal with it and let's make a positive out of it and let's move on and make life better. Right. Right. But it's still, it's still a bit trying though, especially um, when you, I, I know a friend who's been married for 28 years and now she's going through a divorce and it's like, you know, just the things that she has to deal with, you know, and dating is one of the last things on her mind, but it's one of the first things on her mind because it's like, you know, you're married to somebody for 28 years or even take me 12 years and you're used to having regular sex with that person or you're used to, you know, she's just used to seeing that person the way they look in the morning and now, and they used to seeing you. So it's not, no really complaint, but now you have to think of a whole new world to operate in which you're, we're out of touch. You're out of touch sure, with the single uh, world. If you're, yeah. Depending upon how long your marriage was, you know, all of a sudden you're newly single or about to be newly single. Uh, I've certainly seen a, a trend, uh, and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues would agree that mm -hmm. over the, the course of the last uh, decade, decade and a half, you're seeing people who are getting divorced much later in life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've uh, actually been involved in a, in a divorce where, you know, they were married for 35 years mm -hmm. and, you know, everyone uh, takes sort of the, without understanding what the facts of the, of this particular incident uh, involved, you know, the reactions are, what, what are you talking about? You stayed together for 35 years. Why would you possibly want to get divorced now? How can you possibly get divorced now? Who uh, are you? And certainly that was the question that I asked uh, of my client. And, you know, the answer was, uh, it was, it was actually kind of sad. Um, you know, I asked uh, my client at the time, you know, at what point were you not happy in your marriage? Right. And my client was uh, was very candid and said, you know, probably after the first year. <laughs> oh, Jesus. And he stuck with it for so 30 you, odd years. You, you've seen, you know, a situation in that case where someone just stayed in a really, really bad situation and it was toxic. And, you know, that's not good for for you. It's no. not good for your spouse. It's not good for your if children. You have children. It's not good for that. And it leads to all kinds of problems and issues. And as divorce lawyers, we are tasked in a lot of situations with having to uh, work with our clients, and unravel. Some, uh, unravel their issues, their financial issues, their psychological issues. And it involves certainly, you know, a lot of other professions that, right. that are called in to, to assist us in that regard too. Wow. So I want to know what, why divorce? I mean, there's all these different areas of law, right? Like there's a myriad, and I'm sure there's uh, new areas of law that is being created every day now. 
given where we are in society. Sure. Why divorce? Sure. So why am I not, for instance, a real estate lawyer? <laughs> yeah, or a entertainment lawyer. Sure. <clears throat> well, my uh, my path to uh, becoming a divorce attorney uh, started early in my career. Uh, and it was, uh, believe it or not, uh, through my representation of criminal defendants. Mm -hmm. uh, at, the, at the start of my career, I was doing a lot of uh, private retained criminal defense work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it started with, you know, petty offenses, uh, petty larceny, uh, misdemeanor drug charges, things like that. And, and shortly after becoming an attorney, I found myself also representing individuals involved in domestic violence mm -hmm. uh, situations. And some of the individuals who I represented uh, were charged with uh, assaults upon their spouses. And it, it, I found myself in, you know, family court and some of these situations turned into divorces. Mm -hmm. And I had clients who were asking me, can you represent me in, in the divorce? And so it was really a very logical progression uh, that began with criminal defense. And I, I found that the, the divorce work was was rewarding. And, uh, you know, helping individuals in this in the situations they found themselves in was uh, something that I found myself very good and effective mm -hmm. uh, at performing. And uh, really, that's where that's where it began. And uh, actually, New York State has uh, implemented a program many years ago, which they call the uh, the IDV program. And it used to be a situation. What where does you, that IDV stand for? It's a, it's a domestic violence part of a, of the Supreme Court uh, where an individual who is uh, perhaps charged with a crime and or a family offense mm -hmm. in the family setting and is also going through a divorce will be assigned to one Supreme Court judge who will hear all of those matters as opposed to, for instance, having to go to three different courts, a criminal court, a family court and a Supreme Court. Uh, I think the system was uh, finding that not only did that overburden the courts, uh, but you'd have different things happening in different courts at different times with different results that were causing inconsistencies. So the IDV part um, is actually, it was a great idea and it allows one attorney, or in some cases you may need more than one attorney, but it allows the attorneys to appear before one judge who'll hear all those matters and reserve, you know, resolve or attempt to resolve all those matters in connection with one another. So having a criminal defense background uh, has actually helped me when I've got clients who are, who are coming up and going through the IDV uh, process right. who are also seeking or, or uh, being divorced at the same time. Right. Okay. So we're going to hold that thought because there's a whole lot of stuff that you know, it's going to come up at this conversation. So we'll be right back. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Are you stuck in a rut? Negative thoughts, feelings, and conversations got you down? Hi, I'm Noreen Sumter, The Potentiator. Tune in every Tuesday, 9 to 10 Eastern Time, and listen for new ideas on my show, Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way, on talkradio.nyc. do you want to connect with? Are you an entrepreneur or intrapreneur looking to build your following? Welcome to our show. Follow, Follow Me Friday, Friday with Joan and Priya. Tune in every Friday at noon Eastern on talkradio.nyc. We're, We're your digital, digital connectors. connectors. Woo woo! What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Talking Alternative Radio, 24 hours a day.
Hello, we're back. This is Noreen Sumter from Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way. And tonight we're talking about divorce with divorce attorney Jeff Kaplan that says, when till death do you part doesn't happen, you better call Kaplan. <laughs> I love that. I think that's so awesome. So Jeff, um, what I asked you about what had you choose uh, divorce Right. But what is, just tell us a little, where did you grow up? I want to know a little bit about you so that people can put some humanity to what you do. Sure. Um, well, I grew up in, uh, in Dutchess County, uh -huh. uh, just outside of uh, Poughkeepsie, which mm -hmm. is, you know, roughly an hour and 15 minutes or so north uh, of the city. Uh, I went to, uh, to high school uh, up in that area. And um, I was always fascinated by law. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, in high school, there was probably a, an opportunity for me uh, to take part in, uh, as part of one of my classes, uh, sort of a mock trial mm -hmm. type situation. And I remember everyone in the, uh, the class had, had some sort of a, a role mm -hmm. in uh, the, the entire program. And I remember I was not chosen to be one of the lawyers. And I think at that time, it must have had some sort of profound effect on me. Because you went, me. oh, damn it, you all, I'm going to become a real attorney. Yeah, I think at the time, they, they must have selected me to be the bailiff for the court officer. So, you know, I told myself, well, that's great. I'll, I'll bide my time and I'll just become an attorney. And uh, that's really, I'll show you. That's really where it went from there. And uh, probably, who knows, I, didn't, I don't really keep track. I went to a pretty good sized high school, but they're... Uh, to my recollection, we're not a lot of attorneys that uh, were individuals who went on to become attorneys. So uh -huh. I probably was one of the only ones. <laughs> that is well. So you knew from a young age that was something that you were interested yeah, in. Yeah, I, I have always known that. I think my uh, one of my grandfathers, uh, when I was a youngster, made it rather clear. Uh, my grandpa Kaplan, he uh, he told me, you're either going to be a doctor or a lawyer. Uh, and, I, and I was never terribly interested in becoming a doctor for whatever right. reason. So it was always a lawyer. Uh -huh. And I just knew that was my, my track from a very young age. And, uh, you know, I, of course, I've always romanticized, you know, being a lawyer from the TV shows that we've all grown <laughs> Which up Which TV show did and, you watch? Uh, you know, Law and & Order and, and, you know, any lawyers are usually, or at least they were at one point portrayed as um, savory individuals. Uh -huh. And I think I, I grew up. Uh, really respecting that, and I, I remember there was a line in a in a in a one of Al Pacino's movies, uh, The Devil's Advocate, where mm -hmm. you know he was talking about what a law degree really is, and he says, you know, it's uh, the ultimate backstage pass. <laughs> and uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I thought, you know, that was really, quite frankly, the truth. Yeah, and it so really is, in a lot of ways, uh, a backstage pass. Lawyers know you know, enough about just about everything mm -hmm. to do a lot of things. And I think that's probably why a lot of people uh, not only need their assistance, but but seek out their assistance because they really, part of being a lawyer is about knowing how to move things through the process right. and do it as quickly and as efficiently and certainly uh, the best way you can in your client's interests, you know, to be successful. Right. And in, as an attorney, I think that, or a lawyer, I think that you have to be able to see a big picture and you have to be able to tell a story. Absolutely. You, you've got to be able to tell, the, first of all, to see the forest uh, from, from the, the trees. trees. There's no doubt about that. It helps to be a storyteller. Certainly if you're spending any kind of uh time in court whatsoever, whether you're trying cases mm -hmm. uh, or even arguing motions. You've got to be able to synthesize a tremendous amount of material. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to know the facts. You've got to know your client's case uh, very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got to be able to relate whatever your position is and make your argument, hopefully, you know, without relying too heavily on your notes because mm -hmm. that never really looks good. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got to really, you know, present it in a, in a, in a fashion that's going to you know, persuade the trier of, of fact or law, whether it's a judge or in some cases a jury, which you don't have a jury in a divorce situation, mm -hmm. but, a, a, you know, in a divorce situation, you'll have a judge who has to determine from really your arguments, right. your story, you know, how to rule, whether it's, you know, with respect to assets, right. uh, equitable distribution in a divorce case, or child custody, visitation, access issues, things of that nature. So, yeah, you have to be a real uh, good storyteller. And I also think that you have to be able to anticipate 
actions that are going to happen, things that, that are going to be asked. And also there was one thing that popped into my mind was you have to be able to be a good researcher because you have to be able to anticipate with, anticipate where people hide things. Sure. You've, you've really got to know your client's case cold and to know your client's case cold, you have to know not only your client's version of the facts, mm -hmm. you do have to anticipate, you know, the other side's version mm -hmm. of the facts because they have a completely contradictory, conflicting version of what happened in most circumstances. And you've got to be able to deal with that uh, in a way that's going to really persuade, you know, the trier of fact that your version of what it is you're trying to prove is the version, right. the, the truth. Right. Yeah. Very important. So like, so give me a, a give me a pay. So we're on internet, we're on radio and you know, people have their imaginations. I would like for you. So to paint a picture of a couple that, okay, let's, you know, now, okay, let's go back to that, but paint a picture of a couple that comes in. Is it a couple that comes in or is it one person that comes in? Yeah, no, it's really never a couple uh -huh. uh, because it's an adversary uh, situation. Uh -huh. Uh, a divorce lawyer is only permitted to represent one of the parties. Uh -huh. So each of the parties has to be independently represented right. by counsel. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's never really, or should never really be a situation where you're representing a client and the adversary, the spouse is sitting across from you. Right. And it's good that you asked that question because I get asked a lot by a lot of people, you know, can't you just draft the papers and represent both of us? And that is an absolute no, no, right. A uh, very bad idea, especially if you want whatever the outcome of this uh, divorce uh, mm -hmm. to be, to be something that can be upheld because, you know, that opens the door for arguments that there was overreaching uh, or there was a situation where, you know, an attorney gave advice to the adverse party that they relied upon. And it really does open up the door to challenge the judgment, the agreement, whatever it is that was uh, that came out of this divorce. So yeah, in an adversary system, you've really got to have separate independent representation right. to lawyers. Absolutely. So now uh, let's just say uh, somebody comes into your office and they want a divorce. What's the most common thing that people are divorcing over today? Without a doubt, uh, it's financial. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, Say more about that. It, it, it is really, you know, depending upon the length of the marriage, mm -hmm. um, in most instances, it's what has now been recognized they're, and they're using it. They've, they've named it. There's a term for it. Financial infidelity. Uh -huh. Cheating on my money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, certainly there, there has been a lot, uh, of, of airtime and, and, and recognition now of situations where a spouse has undertaken a really secretive financial life, uh -huh. whether it's running up credit card debt. Uh -huh. uh, and of course, that's probably, depending upon what the debt was for, uh -huh. probably one of the uh, less serious things that I've heard about. Uh -huh. uh, but I've certainly seen a lot of very, very, uh, I, what, what I would call, uh, less savory circumstances where a spouse has expended a significant amount of money on bad habits, uh, whether like it be drugs and things like that, certainly substance abuse, Prostitutes. Uh, absolutely any of those types of things. And so you, you see situations where, you know, one spouse didn't really know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden finds out, you know, where is your retirement money that used to be in this account? Mm -hmm. And a spouse is really, going to come forward and have to admit I blew it on Betsy. Yeah. I spent a quarter of a million dollars on uh, my bad habits, you know, and my <laughs> <Betsy>. substance abuse, <laughs> my girlfriends. <laughs> I've, I've actually seen those, those horror stories. Right. Absolutely. And so. what, what is it, what's the experience of that for the person that has been on the sticky end of the lollipop? <laughs> like, uh, I guess you could say you got some explaining to do. Oh, Ricky. <laughs> yeah. What, what in a situation like that, first of all, um, New York, uh, certainly, is is a compulsory financial disclosure state right so you have to understand in any divorce situation there is going to be absolute transparency with respect to finances it's not a situation where you're going to be saying to your spouse or your lawyer i want to i want to hide those uh those pieces you know financial statements and i want to hide those credit card receipts because as attorneys uh, we're going to get those things, whether you give it to us voluntarily or I have to seek a motion before the court 
to have the court compel you to do it, uh -huh. or I'll simply serve a subpoena. I will get those records. I will get those credit card statements. I will get those bank statements. I will get all of that information. I'll get your credit report, and I'm going to go through it, and I'm going to find out where the money went. And there's no hiding. There's really no hiding. Oh, my God. And then the, so back in the day when there wasn't technology, you could hide. It was more difficult uh, to find out uh -huh. in certain circumstances if money went offshore. Uh, certainly much, much harder to, to find it. And mm -hmm. I've been involved in situations where we've had to get uh, some international authorities involved to try mm -hmm. to track down the money. There's a paper trail, though. Right. Even going back 15, 20 years, it's not always impossible to find out where the money went and if you think that you've done a really good job of hiding your tracks you know you should be very careful right because these things do tend to pop up you know somebody finds a box of documents in an attic that somebody put up there you know 15 years ago uh, all of a sudden it's somebody bad. finds it your your spouse finds it and delivers it to their lawyer's office the lawyers are going to take these boxes Jeez, and through the house. call the forensic accountant and go through those documents. And we're going to, we're going to run the paper trail and right. we're going to find out where the money went. And if we don't trace it to a foreign account, we'll certainly trace it to the last account it was in and then ask you questions about where did the money go? The bed. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so what's the second thing, biggest thing that people get divorced for? Probably you know, extramarital affairs okay. that comes up. Uh, so what's quite the top frequently. three? So financial infidelity, physical infidelity. Right. And I would have to say, you know, after that, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a pretty high percentage of, of at least people that have come in to see me who talk about the fact that, you know, our relationship just isn't the fire's gone. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they've gotten on with their lives in so many ways uh, they're very career focused. You know, the children take all of their time. They're mm -hmm. helicopter parents and they've really stopped really dating each other and, and having that sort of fun that keeps them together. And I think that's a real challenge. Maybe they should divorce the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so you hear some of that too. And, uh -huh. and it's important, I guess, for people to, uh, you know, to try to understand that uh, if you're, at least if you're looking to head the marriage off or the, the end of the marriage off at the pass, it's time to start spending, you know, more time concentrating on what might, you know, keep your, your relationship strong. Absolutely. So we're in the last, we're in the halfway mark of our show. And I just want to invite people, if you're experiencing divorce or um, financial infidelity or sexual infidelity, or, you know, you just lost the fire and you might want to call in and share something or ask a question, you can call in at 877-480-480. Four one two zero. We'd love to hear from you. So we'll be back in the two flicks of a monkey's tail. <laughs> You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Are you into comics, movies, and pop culture at large? What about music and TV? Then you're in for a treat. This is Michael Dolce, your host on TalkingAlternative.com. I've been professionally writing comic books, screenplays, and music articles for almost 15 years. Catch my show, Secrets of the Sire, at its new primetime slot, Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and get the inside scoop on the pop culture universe you love to talk about. For more info, go to SecretsOfTheSire.com. Hello, this is Bruce Chamboff, host of the Web Design and Technology Coach. Join me and my guests every Tuesday from 8 to 9 p.m. as we discuss the latest in web design, social media marketing, search engine optimization, and technology. We also discuss popular topics including WordPress, making money online, better Google rankings, and more. Every month, we also feature the best unsigned music from around the world, right here on talkradio.nyc. Talking Alternative Radio, 24 hours a day.
So this is Noreen Sumter from Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way, and we're back. Tonight, I'm speaking with Jeff Kaplan from Kaplan & Associates, who is a divorce attorney. So if you listeners out there have a question for my divorce attorney, please call in at 877-480-4120. Sounded so good. (laughs) So... Jeff, let me ask you, tell me what distinguishes you from other matrimonial attorneys? Well, I would uh, like to think that we are a hard fighting law firm. Mm -hmm. Hard Uh, fighting. We, uh, you know, certainly as as, uh, divorce attorneys, uh, especially here, and this is a special market here in New York Mm -hmm. City. What's special about the market here? Well, there are a lot of divorces. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's the average divorce per year? Average amount of divorces that are taking place in the city? Oh, yeah, New York, uh, roughly quite a few. I, I I wouldn't even want to venture to guess, but it's uh, tens of thousands of mm-hmm. divorces going on at any given time in all the boroughs. And the certainly, I applaud all the uh, the court personnel, the judges, the uh, the special referees. They work so hard because they have such a an, an immense caseload. Right. It's really it's a credit to their uh, their skills. Uh, but there are quite a few going on. But certainly, we're we're a, we're a hard fighting firm. We mm-hmm. don't give up. Uh, we fight very, very hard. We fight uh, very zealously and mm-hmm. uh, really jealously for our clients. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are other other very good law firms, matrimonial law firms here in the city uh, that we go up against. And there are certainly those that don't fight as hard. Right. And uh, you, you get to recognize those that don't uh, from those that do early on. So I think that's one of the things that sets us apart and uh, certainly drives uh, clients to our firm. What is that thing? Because I know you fight hard for your clients. And you also, do you do any sort of mediation before you actually go to fight to see if people can solve this, you know, or maybe divorce amicably if there's such a thing, right? So so Most of the clients uh, who come uh, to me, who retain me, have uh, explored all other pre-litigation options. Mm -hmm. I'm not a mediator. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't mediate. And Mm -hmm. by that, I don't mean that that's not a great idea and something that you should pursue. Mm -hmm. Uh, Certainly trying to mediate a case before you actually have to litigate is is a fantastic idea. It really does take two willing participants who, who are open to the idea of working things out early on. So most of the clients that, that I represent are involved in very, very high conflict situations where mediation was probably something that was discussed, thought about, didn't work, or was never going to work right. uh, as far as uh, the two personalities. Or at least, again, it takes two to mediate. So if one person wants to mediate and the other doesn't, you don't have a mediation. Right. So in terms of make, what makes you, uh, you know, you, you put your boots on and you go to, you really fight for your clients, right? And when you go to court, you know the people that are really ready to do a fight, do battle, or the, and you know the ones that are just like they're just doing whatever their job. What is that thing that you recognize in another person that's interested and really is committed to doing the job? What is that? Sure. Uh, you know, because I know you love your job. It's, it's, I guess the only way I can really describe it, it's a don't give up attitude. Mm-hmm. And by that, I don't necessarily mean don't not settle. Um, but you really have to be, you know, very energetic about preparation. Mm-hmm. Um, you can never be too prepared to deliver your client's position, your client's case. So we over prepare everything. Uh, we know our client's cases very well, and we're prepared to really stick to our client's position uh, until the very end. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't always mean that we don't have clients who we, in our opinion, our legal opinion and our factual opinion, uh, don't believe uh, have an unreasonable position. And certainly we try to discuss with our clients uh, what alternatives might be to an unreasonable mm-hmm. position. Uh, but at the end of the day, the client is the one who makes the ultimate decision as long as it's not illegal and unethical. Mm-hmm. Uh, and certainly, you know, despite our efforts to talk them into something more reasonable, the client is the one who makes the decision about, you know, going forward and whether a case is going to be resolved, settled, uh, or will actually at some point go to trial. Right. And so if I'm a, if I were a, um, okay, for instance, when I was going for my divorce, I wanted to just split everything down the middle because we both came into the marriage with peanuts, right? Split everything down the middle. He gets his bag of nuts. I get my bag. (laughs) Right. And it was easy. My attorney was like, no, you should fight. And I was like, no, I mean, 
let me just split everything down the middle. I'll buy him out of the apartment. And if he wants the apartment, he can have it, but I'll buy him out of the apartment, give him his share. Because we we both came in with nothing. Right. And he was trying to advise me not to do that. Right. Well, you 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 bring up something very interesting and which really is a big part of the law in New York State. Uh, you said, why don't we split everything down the middle, uh, which is, a, you know, a 50-50, you know, easy mm -hmm. distribution of assets. New York is an equitable distribution state and equitable uh, under New York state law is not always equal. Mm -hmm. And there are different factors that courts will consider in arriving at what the court believes is an equitable distribution of assets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those, those factual nuances are different in everybody's case. Right. So depending upon the situation, you have litigants that will be, you know, discussing this breakdown of assets with their respective attorneys. And of course, they're not going to agree that 50-50 is an equitable distribution in all cases. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the longer the marriage, uh, you get into more equal types of distributions. But you have situations where, you know, the marriage might not be so long. Perhaps one spouse contributed much more to the acquisition, the purchase costs of, a, for instance, we'll use an apartment. And you're going to have a situation where that spouse wants that money back off the top, in any distribution and then we'll talk about dividing perhaps the equity that's you know grown in the apartment since that point so right. again we're talking about equitable as opposed to equal wow that's deep because like i'm thinking so if if say for instance just round number i had uh, uh 40 000 and he had sixty thousand, and we put down a hundred thousand he'd want his sixty thousand back in all likelihood that's a real possibility. <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. I'm just thinking, dude, we just split everything down the middle <laughs> and that's it. So it's equitable. So it's not, it's not equal. Right. It's very likely that his lawyer would claim that that uh, 60,000 that he put down was his separate property. The 40 was your separate property. And of course, you should have your respective shares off the top and then divide whatever. So whatever. help me now. How do we, how do we do this? Like, you, you know, I'm getting married next week. Uh, you know, a, a year from now, I have this amount of money. I have this career. He has this amount of money. He has this career. And we were going to buy, but help me. What do I do? Yeah, very, very easy answer. Prenuptial agreement. All right. So tell me about a prenup. I mean, I've just heard the word. I really have not investigated what a prenup is. I know what it is, but how to, to craft a prenup. Sure. Uh, quite simply, uh, a prenuptial agreement is, is a contract, an uh -huh. agreement between two spouses who are contemplating marriage in the near future. Mm -hmm. And it's really a way for them to determine uh, at that point of their marriage, because the document, the contract will only become effective upon their marriage. Mm -hmm. And it's a way for them to take their, their assets, their separate property assets, mm -hmm. and define them very clearly right at the inception of the marriage. You find these types of things, uh, these agreements, being used where one of the, not always one, but usually one of the spouses is coming into a lot of wealth or mm -hmm. bringing a lot of wealth into uh, the relationship from, for instance, family inheritance, mm -hmm. family trusts. Uh, certainly here in this city, we have individuals uh, who have earned it. phenomenal wealth, phenomenal family wealth. Uh, I, I particularly uh, have a lot of situations where other family members, grandparents, parents are going to uh, be giving this wealth to their children and they give it with the caveat that there's no way you're getting married or getting this wealth until you have a prenuptial agreement right. because they're concerned that the equitable distribution laws of uh, the state will come into play. For instance, if there's some commingling of the monies or commingling of the properties and you're going to get a divorce situation. Uh, where one of the uh, the spouses is claiming an interest in this, you know, separate property, if you will, and 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 these divorces become quite quite involved and acrimonious and go on for quite some time. And uh, the fear is that some of those separate property assets or those assets they want to be separate property will somehow be called marital property uh, by the other spouse in a divorce situation. So really, a prenup is you know you setting out right at the very beginning. This is going to be separate property, and here's the definition of it. We'll attach a schedule which lists very specifically what all those separate property assets are, and we'll define what marital property will be during the relationship so everybody's on the same page. And if there's what we call as lawyers a termination event uh, or a separation <laughs> event, if you will, which is <laughs> an expiration of a marriage, 
uh, you've really taken, you know, the divorce away so that we all know this is what we're going to do as far as equitable distribution is concerned. Right. Most of these documents contain clauses that this is going to be incorporated into any judgment. So there's really no question, right. you know, and, and if these uh, documents, these prenuptial agreements are drafted the right way, they're going to stand up. You know, you'll occasionally <coughs> see one spouse attempting to attack those agreements. But if, if they're done correctly, there's really no fear that that's going to be set aside. Right. So there's another question that I wanted to ask you in terms of marriage. Do you think it's obsolete? Marriage? Yeah. Uh, not at all. I, uh, because I, I've always had this thought that we should have contracts like a five year, 10 year, 20 year. And if you have kids, then you can add on. Right. And it has an expiration date. And if you want to renew, I'm always thinking that we should do marriage in that way. <laughs> Well, I, you know, that's a, that's really a novel uh, thought, uh, but no, I don't, I don't believe it's obsolete. I think that, uh, you know, everyone, you hear people talk about the fact that, oh, the divorce rate's 50%, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, that means is it know, really one out of two marriages fail. I don't, I've never done any of the mm -hmm. research myself other than what I've seen on the internet, but yeah. I don't believe it's even as high as 50%. Uh, I don't believe it's a whole lot lower, but uh, it's probably somewhere between 35, 40 you know, percent, something, something of that nature. So it, it's not low. It's, it's not as high as everybody sort of perceives that it is. Uh, but certainly, you know, if you want to say, well, one out of, you know, two marriages fails, I guess you could also say, well, one out of two marriages is, is successful. Right. And I suppose that uh, that's something worth fighting for and sticking with and, you know, really to, you know, aspire to. So now what happens when one person wants to get married, one person wants to divorce and the other person doesn't? <laughs> Well, uh, here in New York, you're going to get divorced. Uh, New York uh, has now become one of the, finally, one of the last states uh, to become what we call a no-fault divorce state. Mm -hmm. You know, and up until the, uh, the law changed a few years ago, uh, you had to have grounds uh, to become divorced in New York, you know, and whether, and, and there were several grounds for divorce, but you used to, in, in most cases, you know, alleged cruel and inhuman treatment of some form yeah, that was uh, one. or constructive abandonment. And, and that yeah. usually would, would suffice to get you your grounds. But New York finally became uh, a no-fault divorce state. So now we have, uh, you know, Section 170.7 of the Domestic Relations Law, which is the irretrievable breakdown of the relationship for a period of at least six months. Mm -hmm. And if you can, you know, if you're going to allege that, it doesn't require certainly that both spouses believe that the marriage is irretrievably broken down. Right. It only takes one spouse. So if your spouse wants a divorce, alleges the no-fault ground, and the other spouse says, no, it's really not irretrievably broken down, you're still going to get divorced. You can't prevent that. <clears throat> so when we come back, I just want to hit on the subject of like um, gay marriages, like, you know, marriages, and how that's now added a new piece of the pie to the whole divorce situation certainly so we'll be right back in a moment <laughs> you're listening to the talking alternative network are you a conscious co-creator are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant. And on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you feeling unhappy with your body, shape, or size? Ever feel out of control with food? I'm Elizabeth from Nourish the Soul, and on this show, you will uncover the root to these imbalances and discover a permanent solution to having a healthy relationship to food and your body. Join us every Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. TalkingAlternative.com
So we're back in our final quarter at, from, this is Noreen Sumter, I, like, <laughs> from Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way. And tonight I'm speaking with Jeff Kaplan from Kaplan Associates about divorce. And we've just had a, a lot of information. New York City has just become a no-fault divorce. So if, if you're in a relationship and you want to be divorced, you can now say, you don't, it pretty much it means you don't have to have a reason. It's like, you can just get a divorce. You don't have to have, well, you have to have the no fault ground. Right. The, the relationship has to have been ir irretrievably broken down, but right. your spouse won't be contesting it, so to speak. So basically it's non-contested. More or less, yes. Yeah. So that's really great. So you no longer have to suffer in a relationship that doesn't work for you. That's correct. So I want to know, like, you know, we've just had this laws passed where gay people can marry each other. And um, how is that impacting the court system? Well, certainly uh, the passage of the, uh, the Same-Sex Marriage Act has opened up uh, new avenues for marriage mm -hmm. between uh, individuals. Uh, and one would think, uh, at least from a, a numbers perspective, that would be great for divorce lawyers because, wow, no, more people now will have the opportunity to uh, marry their same-sex partner, mm -hmm. and certainly that's just going to mean more work for us as, as divorce attorneys. Mm -hmm. I don't think that in practice that's what's happened so far, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, because... It's still relatively new, though. Right. Um, and I don't know if it's if that's really the case, but uh, certainly in my practice, I've not seen uh, any huge, you know, increase sure. in same-sex uh, divorces. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen an increase in same-sex prenuptial agreements. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, at least the, maybe they're just smarter. I've, well, I've, I've read certainly some articles that have suggested that, uh, um, in same sex marriages, the, uh, the women are less likely to divorce than the men who mm -hmm. are in same sex relationships. At least that's what I've read in, in some of the literature that I've seen. But, right. uh, I think it's probably too new to, to say that there's, you know, any uh, development of a trend. Mm. So, now, I just want to take these last few minutes and hear a little bit about, do you have anything that you want to market, anything that you want to share with people? And then I want to know a little bit about what does a divorce attorney do in his off time? <laughs> well, uh, from, a, from a, I guess, a, a marketing uh, standpoint, uh, you know, anyone, I guess, who would find themselves in a, in a, in a divorce or a near divorce situation or a situation where they want to at least have a consultation with a divorce attorney uh, should feel free to reach out uh, to the firm. Well, uh, they want to write a prenup. Yeah, absolutely. Prenups. We do uh, prenuptial agreements. We do postnuptial agreements. Uh, and certainly we're available uh, for our clients uh, or our potential clients for a consultation to discuss any of those things at any time. So, mm -hmm. Uh, we really we 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 have quite a varied base of uh, hours. You know, mm -hmm. we're we're usually available. You know, pretty late at night. We have a lot of people who want to come in after they're done at work. Mm -hmm. You know, six o'clock, something like that, or come in at lunchtime. So we uh, will vary our schedule to make ourselves available. And if it's possible, you know, if someone wants to come in on a weekend, we'll do that also. Oh, cool! That's nice. Yeah. So tell us, what does a divorce attorney do for recreation and fun? Well, I can tell you what this divorce attorney yes, likes to do. do. Certainly, I don't know about the rest of them. But, uh, yeah, you're in little cupboards, and this is what they do. No, okay. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, well, for me anyway, I, I think I must have been a chef in a previous life. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, One of my grandfathers was a chef. Uh, he was actually the head chef up at uh, Vassar College uh -huh. for about 35 years. And uh, he had worked himself up from the dishwasher there uh, all the way to the head uh, chef of, of, of the uh of the food services up there. He was there when, uh, um, I believe, uh, Jackie Onassis went to school up there. I believe Anthony Bourdain uh, was at Vassar for a, for a semester or two. He was probably there for that too. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I developed a real love of cooking from my, my grandfather, who was of uh, Italian descent. And uh, for me anyway, I love to cook. I know you love barbecue. I love to barbecue. I love to cook. Uh, it's just something I find very rewarding. It's very therapeutic for me. I like to cook for large groups, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it probably is a way for me anyway, after having uh, worked a long week, you know, and, and as a divorce lawyer, I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, we're in a lot of uh, stressful situations mm -hmm. with our clients, and, you know, cooking for me is, is, is a real way to relax and unwind and really enjoy, you know, whether you're with friends or family or both, 
uh, and sort of, you know, let your hair down and, and, and just chill. And I also know that you like to hike. Was it the Appalachian <laughs> trail thing that you did? Uh, well, yeah, we, we, uh, I have a twin brother uh-huh. and he are, he and I are actually, uh, backcountry patrol members at mm-hmm. the Mohonk, uh, preserve, which is up in Ulster County. And we spend a lot of time, uh, walking around up in the mountains up there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, certainly the Hudson Valley is such a beautiful area. Um, you know, we love to just get outdoors and, you know, if, if we can spend an afternoon hiking and really enjoying nature, then that's, uh, that's, that's a day well spent. Right. And yeah. you have a doggy that you love. I do. Absolutely. <laughs> my, uh, my little French bulldog, uh, Jersey, uh, he's a, he's a, he's a great guy. Uh, <laughs> probably the love of my life, you know, the, the child I don't have. <laughs> or maybe the wife. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. No, but I just saw your face lit up when you when you spoke about yeah. me. Well, I've always so I've always loved uh, loved animals, uh-huh. and uh, my family's been blessed with a with a great dog. And I think pets are great. You know, they relieve stress. Uh-huh. And man's best friend, and you know, they're always Boy, there with a, with a smile. So right. he's a great great dog. So, is there anything that you want me to ask you that you want these people to know about you, the listeners to know about you and your business? what i want you to ask me yeah so you're gonna say it to me and then i'm gonna ask you it and then they're gonna hear it yeah <laughs> how, oh here's a good one how to deal with pets in divorce yeah i'd love to answer that question yes please go right ahead man you know so how do you deal with pets in the divorce well uh that i have found to be a subject that is probably just as sensitive and near and dear to clients hearts as their own children in some circumstances, <laughs> in some uh, circumstances. maybe even more near and dear uh, under New York state law, uh, pets are um, really viewed as personal property. Uh-huh. So there are, you know, not much, not much really goes into the determination other than, you know, considering it another piece of property. Mm-hmm. And in this case, it happens to be living property. So I've actually read some very good opinions uh, from a judge, uh, Judge Judge Cooper here in New York County, who's had to deal with some visitation issues right. um, involving the pet pet dog. So, uh, you know, in, in, in cases where it's highly contested, you know, certainly uh, it's not a child, so the mm-hmm. court's not going to utilize a best interest determination necessarily to award, you know, custody or sole custody of a pet, although I don't suppose that's completely outside the bounds of possibility if mm-hmm. there's some issues. Uh, But I think that uh, the courts are most likely going to stand behind uh, a situation where they devise a schedule. Mm -hmm. And in a situation where two people can't work it out, they're going to have to share access and or visitation time, if you will, with their pet. Wow. Yeah. We didn't touch on children, but it's the same situation with children, right? Uh, Slightly different. uh, But, you know, on on the issue of, of pets, it really does come up quite a bit. It, it does. You have a situation where, you know, and especially in a custody situation where there's a, a pet, you know, you would think that the pet would maybe go where the kids went and spend time with the kids. Right. You know, um, a lot of a lot of couples, divorcing couples are really moving towards shared custody arrangements these days mm-hmm. where the kids are spending, you know, nearly equal time with both parents more and more. Mm-hmm. So I guess that means the dog goes uh, or the cat goes where the kids go. <laughs> or the budgie. <laughs> So when you see the kids moving from mom's house to dad's house, you know, maybe you see the pet carrier going along with them too. Right. Yeah. This is like, I mean, uh, yeah, I know you deal with high net worth individuals, but what about people that don't have a high net worth, but they have same situations, similar situations? Sure. How, how, how is that like just in, in a nutshell? <laughs> well, it makes it a lot easier because they're not fighting about money, but oh. <laughs> believe it or not, people still fight about money that they don't have. Uh-huh. Uh, but in those situations, you also find people fighting about debts. Debt. And there are a lot of people uh, who have to have, you know, a plan put into place, whether it's in their divorce or it's going to be dealt with post-divorce where that debt, that marital debt has That's to be deep. dealt with because creditors will usually be looking, depending upon how significant it is, for payment. Right. And that's something that really can haunt you. It can haunt your credit. It can haunt your ability to get on with life, mm-hmm. to go out and, you know, buy another home or rent another home. Those are those are factors that come up quite right. a bit that have to be dealt with, certainly. And in a situation where there's been financial infidelity, <clears throat> it can get even worse. I wish we had more time because I would like to talk about, um, you know, the various different things like how do people, you know, get back on their feet after divorce and 
you know, how do people deal with the, the divorce and stuff mentally and emotionally, how it lingers on for years. People haven't let go their divorce, but they love to talk about stuff like that, but we don't have any more time. But Jeff, I just want to tell you that I am so happy that you came on the show. I'm sure there's a million things that we could talk about in this arena, but again, time only allows us an hour. But I just want to thank you for coming on the show. And I want to know, did, did you have a good time? Absolutely loved it. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. It's, it's been a real pleasure to be here and love to come back anytime. Definitely, definitely. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you for sharing all your knowledge. And like Jeff said, give your information again, your email and your name and that stuff. Sure. Uh, it's Jay Kaplan and Associates. I'm Jeff Kaplan. And the number is 212-601-9278. And we're right in Midtown Manhattan on 42nd Street, right across the street from Grand Central Terminal. So this is the end of Beyond Potential Live Life Your Way. Thank you for be tuning in. Thank you for tuning in and listening in. I greatly appreciate it. And I will speak to you again next week. Same bat time, same bat station. Bye. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network.